I was uh, an MTC commissioner by virtue of being appointed by the governor to BCDC, and I was the BCDC delegate to MTC. I was on the ABAG Regional Planning Committee and on the Environmental Management Task Force that Diane Feinstein, by the way, chaired, but not uh, in the in the uh, close knit. I mean, ABAG is a uh, an organization of local government officials, and I was not in local government, but I was intimately involved with ABAG. So do you remember what years um, you were on the uh, MTC Commission? It was in the, I think, the late 70s through the 80s. Uh, I was on for probably 10 years, and I, but I don't know the specific dates. Both Larry Doms and Steve were executive officers while I was on the commission. I see. And then what about your time at ABEG? Do you remember about what, what years uh, ago? For a longer time because we were involved when ABEG was formed uh, and uh, we looked upon ABEG as kind of the public sector counterpart. The Bay Area Council is a nonprofit organization supported by business firms espousing regional solutions and ABEG was the local government. So from the very beginning, we worked very closely, either formally, sometimes at odds on particular issues. Uh, and I was involved in some of the some of the committees and task forces, but mostly it was a, a you know, two organizations kind of working in parallel. So what's the history of the Bay Area Council and, and sort of how, how did, uh, how did the um, ABAG sort of, sort of uh, develop? Well, the Bay Area Council was formed immediately after World War II, 1945, by both leaders in business and government. They were concerned that when the war ended, that the shipyards would close down, everybody would move back to Iowa, and we'd become a ghost town. So originally, there were some federal redevelopment funds that were available to organizations that wanted to generate it economic growth. And so the Bay Area Council was formed out of that. It was immediately determined that that was a misplaced concern, that people weren't going to go back to Iowa, they were going to stay. But as is usually the case, when an organization gets started, even though its mission is invalid, they can continue and do other things. So the council stayed, stayed in business uh, from 1945, uh, generally doing things like espousing BART, uh, transportation, other transportation solutions, land use, regional planning, those kinds of things. We were we had a research arm that did research about the Bay Area economy, uh, small staff, small budget, but we were the cream of the Bay Area business leadership. The CEOs of the Bay Area were all involved in the council uh, and quite seriously involved, both uh, espousing their corporate interests that doing things at the regional level would make their business operations a little bit easier. But besides that, have, you know, having kind of a collective vision that that's good, that's good for the region. So uh, that was really kind of the, uh, the start of the organization. As each executive officer came in, as is always the case, this, the, the direction changed ever so slightly, but it still is basically what it was. I was, I was president from 1966, excuse me, 1972 to 1997 for 25 years. Well, I was, the first four years of my professional career were assistant manager of the San Mateo County Development Association, which is a city county, a, a county a public-private partnership doing economic development. For four years, I was the manager of the Fremont Chamber of Commerce. For six years, I was the assistant manager of the Bay Area Council. My president became, my predecessor became president of University of Pacific, and I succeeded him. And then when I left, Sonny, Sonny McPeak took my position, and now there's a new executive officer. So my entire career has been in organization management, nonprofit, business, kind of business oriented, economically oriented. Well, yeah, uh, as a matter of fact, I think the Bay Area Council was one of the strong leaders behind the creation of BART. And it was done primarily by Steve Bechtel. Steve was a fabulous corporate CEO. He had a great vision for the Bay Area. 
but Steve decided that he probably that that the Bay Area could use a transit system, and he decided it number one because he thought he could build it, and number two because he did have this regional vision. He had been one of the founders of the Bay Area Council, and therefore he kind of used the council as the organization to to promote it. So we were involved in the, and this is before my time. We were involved in the original BART study, which envisioned the Bay Area, the, the, the BART system as a nine county all around the Bay system. Uh, and that obviously did not materialize. So from the very beginning, we were strong advocates for BART and did some of the studies that, you know, with respect to where the lines ought to be, what the economic impacts ought to be, uh, and followed it very closely. I think that when we were in the early stages of BART, the original intent was that it was going to be a nine-county system, and it was going to it was going to inv it was surround the bay. But clearly, if it was going to include Contra Costa County and Salom Solano County, the, the 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 lines going out to those counties would have to be would have to be uh, included. And as it turns out, that was not economically feasible. The, the legislation that created BART established a bond limit, I think it was, I'm, I'm not sure, $783 million. And that clearly meant that all of the stuff that we wanted to happen couldn't happen. There wasn't, there wasn't going to be enough money. And then through various mechanisms, various counties dropped off and it ended up being nine counties, then six counties, then five, four, and three. And um, and you know that's what we what, that's what we ended up with. I th I, I think that if it's too bad that San Mateo and Santa Clara at least didn't come in because that would have then created the, uh, the, the 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 system around the bay. And I think that you know that sounds nice, but from a transportation point of view, it makes a lot of sense because that's primarily the hub of the commutation in the Bay Area is that, you know, the, the, the corridor up and down the peninsula, the corridor up and down the East Bay going in into San Francisco and around there. Uh, having a fixed rail system going out to Sonoma, Solano, Marin counties that have, don't have the kind of density really don't make that kind of sense. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have public transportation, but a fixed rail system is very expensive to build and very expensive to operate. So. You know, I think if I if I were to uh, kind of w wish for what we had, it would have been definitely included San Mateo and Santa Clara, but I'm not sure it would have included the other counties. Well, while business, while government leaders were instrumental in the formation of the council, it really became almost exclusively a business organization. Uh, as I said, our board was the blue ribbon of Bay Area business, the chief executives of Chevron and Bank of America and Hewlett Packard and Kaiser. And the, the government side of it dropped off. I, I don't know why that happened or when it happened. And then, of course, when ABAG was formed, there was a public sector counterpart anyway. Um, with respect to a regional vision, I don't know that many people can agree on what a regional vision really is. Is it a regional transportation system? Is it one government for the 100 cities and nine counties? Is it an air quality basin? And so at the very, at the very least, people thought intergovernmental cooperation needs to be improved. Uh, there are certain things that are inherently local and inherently regional. The things that are regional we ought to find governance for, and that's why the creation of MTC and the Air Board and BCDC, because the Bay was regional, air quality is regional, transportation. But when it came to land use, that's when everything fell apart, because builders didn't like the concern that a regional agency would stop growth. Local government didn't want a regional agency to intervene with land use decisions, which is really kind of the heart of local government. So uh, regional vision is in the eye of the beholder. And I would say that while most people would agree that there ought to be better cooperation at the regional level, it's not very high on people's priority list. It's not, uh, when I, you know, we, we, we uh, sponsored 
five or six regional bills, the Bay Area Council did, in some cases in cooperation with ABAG, in some cases with the League of Women Voters and the Greenbelt Alliance, but basically we were the, we were the, the keys behind that. Um, and uh, uh, even our own members who felt that the notion was good when it came to the fine print and, oh, you're going to do that. I, what does that mean to, you know, what is good? You know, if I live in Moraga, does that mean that I'm not going to be able to protect my open space? So there was a, there, it was a pretty fuzzy notion and frankly, I think still is. Well, ABAG was created out of, uh, uh, I forget what the act of Congress was, but it was, I think, a pilot program to fund the, 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 an entity that would bring local government together. I don't remember whether bringing local government together was a better way to cooperate or whether it was in fact regional planning. And again, I think you'd have different points of view about that. But um, clearly from the beginning, uh, local government had to be at the table. I must admit that I often said this irreverently, that I thought that ABAG was a local government protective society, not a regional planning agency. Uh, I know that Reven Tranter, who, who was my opposite number, really wanted to take it more toward regional planning, but many of his members, local government officials, said, you know, my constituents are not crying out for regionalism, they want to protect land use at the local level, and if you were talking about land use, then you know, it's not going to work. And therefore, ABAG was always, as I say, a little bit nervous, a little bit schizophrenic about, about regional planning. But from the very beginning, it was well accepted. It did some good things. Uh, it had a great staff. Uh, it had, you know, good cooperation, more, more good cooperation from the suburban communities than, for example, San Francisco and Oakland. And I think that was because those were the emerging communities. That's where things were going to happen. And so they thought we better get our oar in the water to make sure that our interests are protected. Why do you think regionalism is important? I'm not sure it is. I'm really not sure it is. I, uh, when, we, when we were espousing regionalism, it wasn't intended. And, and, and by the way, the environmental community was somewhat suspicious of why a business organization would do it. You know, is this the way to get all the developers to pave over the bay and the what? And, but it was really, it was, a, it was an honorable intention that, that the region ought to somehow be more cohesive. Again, in a not too well-defined way. Um, but um, So at that time, it wasn't that we were thinking about how we would save, how government could be more efficient and we would save money. It really was that regional cooperation was important. Um, when you take a look at the region, is it the nine counties that ABAG's jurisdiction? Is it the 13 counties that include Yolo County and, and, and Monterey County? Is it the corridors up and down the peninsula? So, you know, even the definition of what the region is, is difficult. Um, secondly, if you can come up with a nine, let's say nine counties, because that's the Air Board, it's MTC, it's ABAG, and it's BCDC. When you do that, you've got urban, you've got rural, you've got high tech, you've got agriculture, you've got blue collar, you've got highly educated, it's, there is no common denominator. And therefore, when you talk about the importance of regionalism, I really think that it now comes down to, and maybe this is because of what I now see is the horrible fiscal situation that exists in California. It really may come down to more, what can we do to consolidate the activities of local government to save money as opposed to the regional cooperation thing. I have a feeling that at any time, even when the Bay Area Council was espousing it, if you asked anybody, what are the 10 most important things facing us, regionalism would never have been at the top of, from anybody, including the Bay Area Council and its members. 
I think we would have th much more thought about educational and you know and better and you know better traffic management and and those kinds of things and therefore at the very best it was always kind of a stepchild if you will to the in the in the public policy debate so i can't say that it was ever important and i can't say that it's important now that doesn't mean that we ought not move toward more however you want to define regional, certainly regional cooperation, certainly better regional planning, certainly better, you know, maybe consolidation of local government functions. But it's, I don't think anybody would consider it to be as important as the other list of things, improving education, solving our fiscal crisis, that, you know, those are the, we, the Bay Area Council started a Bay Area poll. Number one on the list of the problems in the Bay Area was always traffic congestion, always traffic congestion. And so, you know, to that mean, that means to get cars off the road, the other car, not my car, or it means build more tra transit. So do you think there is a future for regionalism? Not much more than there is now. Uh, it, whether, you know, we've talked about regional planning. I don't think we will ever get regional planning as long as local government exists. And that's, and that's a fact of life. Whether it's good or bad, the fact is local governments were created. They're relatively autonomous. They can't, we can't do away with local government without changing the California Constitution. And there, from a planning point of view, I don't think it'll happen. From the point of view of, uh, of, uh, possibly creating incentives. MTC, I think, has tried saying, well, we're going to tie transportation planning to land use decisions. That, you know, you can go a certain, a certain direction in that. With respect to air quality, clearly that's a regional issue. Clearly, there's no debate about that. So in some areas, in some times of, types of functions, yes, but when it from our point of view, the Bay Area Councils, when we first thought of this, it was really mostly a regional planning mechanism, and I don't think in our lifetime we will see that happen. I think regional planning properly done could be um, a very good way to regulate land use. It also could be a very bad way. As with any government, it's the people who do it. Uh, and, you know, and so, um, if you had enlightened people who saw all sides of the land use question, the conservation side, the development side, all of that. Uh, but I, um, I, I, I can't tell. I mean, I, I, th I think in theory it could be, it would be better. I would never want one land use authority in the Bay Area that obviates and do does away with local, local plant, local land use and zoning. But there are ways that you can say there are certain facilities of regional significance, an airport, for example, or a prison, or, or, you know, or a bay, if you will, that, that, that go beyond the, the, the ability of local government to properly regulate and understand its uh, extraterritorial impacts. Those things by all means. But when it comes time to the local shopping center or the local housing project, I think that it's appropriate for local government to retain its ultimate authority. When I, when I had my first date with my wife, I'm, I married very late in life. My first date was in August 1980. She asked me what I did, and I described the Bay Area Council. And she said, boy, that really sounds interesting, but how do you know when you've done anything? When you're dealing with long-term policy, like the council did, does, and like ABAG does, you don't see the incremental kind of improvements and benefits. So if you said to me, you know, what's ABAG done with respect to a particular land use solution or a particular uh, air quality, I, I couldn't do that. Same way with the Bay Area Council. I think in both, in both cases, the council and ABAG, we have been successful in, in keeping the notion of regionalism alive bringing people together so that they can understand, even with their own narrow parochial 
interests, even with those which, they're, which are valid. That's why a city council member is elected, is to represent the interests of Larkspur. But even with that, to understand how what they do affects the neighboring city and what's going on in the region affects them in every way, land use, education, the economy. I think that that's the biggest accomplishment of an organization like ABAG. And, you, and I'm not sure if you're going to get to this, but you know, the Bay Area Council and ABAG created the Bay Area Economic Forum, which was a public-private partnership to think about economic issues because the Maybag was doing it from a governmental point of view and the council was doing it from a business point of view, both of which are valid, but the, you know, you can't do one without the other. And, the, and therefore it created the Bay Area Economic Forum. I, I think that, that that marriage was good. Um, the, the, the notion of, 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 of uh, continuing to create an aura around regionalism, even without having to define specifically what it is, is good. I don't know that ABAG or the Bay Area Council will ever be elevated to making the kinds of decisions. When we were forming, when we were creating legislation, when we were introducing legislation, the thing we kept saying is you can't have regionalism without regional authority. Somebody's got to be able to say you have to do this or you can't do this. The Bay Area Council can't do it, ABAG can't do it. So we were, we were in our advisory, we are educational, we are awareness building, we are, you know, let's get together and, and share our common problems. I don't know whether ABAG would consider that to be successful, but I think that's what it has always done and will always do, and that's what I think the Bay Area Council will always do. I think that MTC as a planning and funding agency has a lot more muscle. I mean, it's got more authority than an ABAG does. Money is not you must do this or you can't do this, but it is we're not going to give you the money <laughs> unless you do it our way. And therefore, the authority of MTC is pretty solid, as it is with any funding, funding agencies. I think uh, uh, the, the, the uh, as you asked earlier about speaking with one voice, it has done that much better than local governments having done it on their own. I think its promotion of ABAG, ex of uh, BART extensions, its promotion of uh, both highways and rail, and, or, or highways and, and, and public transit, Fabulous staff, dedicated staff, good commissioners. I think, I think MTC has a very good track record. The public works people always underestimate the cost and underestimate and, and overestimate the usage. So whether it's BART, whether it's the bridge, you know, we have these, the, and, and, and we're seeing it in spades with uh, the high-speed rail up and down the state. I mean that, you know, we've spent, we've got, we've adopted a nine billion, nine billion dollar bond issue. They say it's going to cost forty billion. I think it's going to be sixty billion. They say it'll be uh, self-supporting. There's no way it's going to be that. That doesn't mean it is not a good public works project. BART doesn't support itself, but BART is a fabulous success for the Bay Area. Um, uh, I, I think that MTC's support of BART and public transit generally is its, ba is its greatest success. I, I'm sure that you would have liked me and others to talk about the importance of regionalism. I think anybody that does um, has this somewhat vague notion about what the world could be like. But the practical matter with politics, with economics, with the individual behavior of people and the different points of view of people, I think that regionalism uh, will never see what the Bay Area Council wanted it to be and the ABAG, some of what ABAG wanted it to see. And therefore, I have to keep it fairly low on the, on the priority list of of public issues, and especially right now, you know, we're California and local government. I mean, what we've got is an absolute, I mean, this is 
chaos. This is, uh, things have never been bad. And I think when we see what can happen to local government services, uh, you know, the arts and libraries, but even public safety and the very, the very uh, fundamental services that local government is supposed to deliver. You know, I mean, look, I, I think that the, that the, the, the bankruptcy of, of Vallejo is only the starting point. I think that we will see more local governments bankrupt. Now, what that could conceivably lead to is not regionalism, but multi-government consolidation, bringing together the police and fire departments. I live in Larkspur. We have a two-city police and fire department, the Twin Cities. There are so many municipal services that could easily be shared. I mean, that's, so if, if I were pushing toward regionalism, it would be what do we do to make local government work better so we can save local government. Now that's not regionalism, but I think that, you know, that's now the, the upper end of the agenda with respect to, uh, uh, you know, to the, to the things that local government officials should be thinking about. I would consolidate services and I would consolidate some local governments. I think a city of 15,000 doesn't make sense. Uh, and I, you know, I recognize that we, you know, we live in a community, we want to save the character of that community. Uh, and we think that that's done because we've got a small city council, but it doesn't make any sense. I mean, the, I can see, you know, I live in Larkspur, I can see Larkspur and Corte Madera and, and Ross and Kentfield all being one city. Uh, you know, there, there are really, you can either by virtue of looking at the homogeneity of the city or the, the physical boundaries or the histories, you, there, are, there are a lot of easy ways to think about how you bring cities together to make them more efficient. And by the way, I think that besides consolidating services, we will see a time when in fact cities will think about consolidation. So first the services, then the cities themselves. But I wouldn't be a bit surprised that, it, you know, in 2020, if we, were, if, we, if we were now celebrating ABAG's 60th birthday and MTC's 50th, that there would be some very serious conversations about consolidation of, of the governments themselves, including the land use functions.